Alito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. Last November was the 175th anniversary of the Irish gift in which the Choctaw people came together to donate money to the Irish during the Irish potato famine. You can hear more about that gift and the history of the Great Famine in Native Chalk Talks Season 3, Episode 9 with Seth Fairchild, Executive Director of the Chitta Foundation. So this year in 2023, we recognize once again the anniversary of the bond between the Irish and the Choctaw with my guest, Sam Guerrero Stitt. We have so many interesting topics to cover today from your ancestral stories, Sam, and how they tie into the Irish famine to an incredible project you're doing for the tribe and more. Sam, welcome to Native Chalk Talk. Lito, Chema so a little about you, you are Choctaw and you do some good work with tribes pertaining to social welfare, correct? That's right. Well, Anne, I'm excited to be part of your announcement about Natam Gen. Tell us about it. Yeah, so Native American Genealogy LLC or Natam Gen. Um, actually, you can go to www.natamgen.com. Um, so we just had our put our website up just a few days ago. Um, so it is focusing on Native American genealogy. And uh, I probably have to put a disclaimer up too that we're going to be focusing on um, US-based tribes just because you know there's yeah. Canadian First Nations up there and then all of the Americas has tribes, obviously, but we have to limit our scope. Um, sure. Uh, but I, it's, it's been interesting. I've done genealogy for uh, probably 15 years, maybe more. Um, and you know, I kind of did it as a side hobby and then it kind of grew. And then I did my graduate project on tribal memberships. Let's say I'm a person who doesn't know anything about my heritage or my genealogy. And I want to come to you and say, maybe here's a DNA test I took. And it says 25% Native American. Here's some stories from my grandmother or here are my great grandmother's maiden and um, uh, married surnames. What do you do from there with, with your business that you have? So that's a great question. It depends on what tribal background you're from or that you suspect. So we'll keep it Choctaw centric here. So say someone comes to me and they said their great grandmother was, they believe was Choctaw, whether they have DNA tests, whatever, they, they have a name, they have an, uh, a, a, a range of dates. Um, the person existed in the real physical plane. So they were probably, they had children, obviously, to have descendants. They probably had a spouse at one time or another. So they existed. So what we're trying to do is find them in the record. Now, here's the thing. Like if we're talking about Choctaw people, after the removal, there were only, let's say, three main places where Choctaws were found, and they had a distinct sociopolitical and demographic disposition. After the removal, um, the Mississippi ban had several thousand, low thousands of people that stayed in the East. There was a very tiny uh, community in Louisiana, which was Bayou Lacombe and Gina. And then there was also some Choctaws that intermarried with other tribes like Chittimacha and Cushada. And we're talking several hundred people only. Like Gina only has, I wanna say six or seven founding families as, as their main groups, right? And then there was Choctaw Nation and Actually, I just, I have the final Dawes roll. So in 1907, in Indian Territory, what's now Oklahoma, we're talking about 17,488 um, by blood members who were from Choctaw Nation originally. And then they were joined by 1,600 Mississippi Choctaws, which was a subset. We can talk about that later, but it was the final removal parties. So we're talking about, I'm bad at math in my head, but let's say just under 20,000 people 
that existed in Choctaw Nation at that time, plus a few thousand in Mississippi, plus a few hundred in Louisiana. And we can also add a just a smattering of mixed blood families that lived in Texas. Mm -hmm. That's the entire Choctaw population that existed at the turn of the 20th century. So that's it. That's your demographic reality that we're trying to narrow down. So now we're looking at great grandma. So we know her name. If she was Choctaw, she would be either from those communities or her family would come from those communities. And let's yeah. say she was, let's say she was Choctaw from Choctaw Nation. So we'd find her, um, let's say she was an adult uh, alive in uh, the turn of the 20th century. We would find her family listed on the 1885 Choctaw Nation census, the 1890 annuity rolls. They would be listed as Choctaw citizens. They would have been married in Choctaw Nation and they would have been found on Dawes mm -hmm. and they would have got allotments. Now, here's the thing when people say, well, Dawes didn't capture everybody. It's like, no, it didn't. You're right. Just like any bureaucratic thing, right. they didn't, it didn't capture a hundred percent, but let's say 99 point something percent, you know, and the right. folks that right. were missed and there were, if they were missed individually, what are the chances that they were missed on the 1890s annuity rolls, 1885 rolls? Their family would have been known. Their family would have been on the Dawes roll. So even these aberrations, we can still find, uh, you know, the family connections. Now, the other thing that people say, well, because <clears throat> this is part of the mythology to explain, like, why if if I have a story of my great grandma was native, but they're not on the rolls, there's a lot of rationalization. Well, they they tried to hide out. They didn't want to be on the rolls. The Dawes roll was actually an allotment roll. And what had happened is it was it, it was a federal policy, federal law that got enacted. There was nothing that you could do about it. There were some factions of traditionalists that tried to fight it. But at the end, when it was going to be implemented, everyone got enrolled. Like no one missed the, the roles like as a, as a group. There was just sm small aberrations. So Choctaw members would have had land rights collective land rights in Choctaw Nation before Dawes came in. So they had property, they had range lands that had been cleared, fences, houses, stores, houses in some cases that had you know, several stories and family spreads that, you know, you had extended families for several generations at that point. Mm -hmm. And the goal was when these tribal members go in and a lot of this for Choctaw members that want to dig into their family history and find their allotments. A lot of times that would be where your family was from, had been from for a long time. So they were trying to get their family plots assigned to them in Dawes. And for, for tribal citizens to not, to choose not to enroll would mean they would be giving up all of their property. It was just unheard of. It, there were a few people that that missed out, and especially the Mississippi Choctaws that were actually disenfranchised, but that was not the case for the majority of tribal members. Mm -hmm. So to to tie it back to you know you're you're trying to find great grandma, we'd find her in records, and Choctaw Nation, like the five civilized five civilized tribes, <laughs> they don't have a blood quantum minimum. So if you were disconnected for some reason, but you came from that background, you'd be enrollable. Uh, mm -hmm. So great grandma would be found on rolls. And if she was born, let's say she was born right after her parents would be found. So then it's just a matter of um, tying yourself, the modern descendant to your ancestor on the, what we call the base rolls. And Dawes is the base role for the five tribes. And you just, you establish that connection and, and that's it. So, but to kind of, to contextualize it for other tribes, you might have a situation where, um, let's say, oh, here's a good example. Catawba tribe was a tribe that they had been recognized, but then somehow they lost their recognition and then they had to get re-recognized. And I can't remember the exact date of their role, but I want to say it was in the eighties or early nineties. Okay. And so it was, it's funny because the, the, their base role that they use is on a federal register, which is a federal publication. So everyone that was recognized as a Catawba tribal member for the reorganized tribe is now listed on a federal register publication. So everyone that's Catawba today descends from those people. That's it. So now if you're talking about very remote Catawba ancestry, you'd have to go back to earlier roles and records. But 
Um, right. And that's also a distinction, too. We're talking about ancestry and tribal affiliation. Yes. So in your in your business there, you are helping people find grandma. Also, if there's a tie to the Dawes roles, you're helping them, you know, bring those bridge that gap, basically. Um, I want to make a little disclaimer about something. I see this all the time where people go, oh my gosh, I think I might be Chickasaw. And I'm like, oh, that's so exciting. And then they're like, yeah, my kid's about to go to college. I would love to see if I can, you know, find out if they are so that they can get all their college paid for. And I'd like to let people know, first of all, there's no money tree for your kid going to college. Um, I think the best thing to do is go to Sam, see if he can help you find out about more about your heritage and then learn about the Chickasaw tribe, learn about your family's stories and your ancestral stories and the cool things they did. And no, not everybody came from a chief. I'm one of those that definitely did not come from that <laughs> type of people. All these people you see behind me, most of them were in jail a good amount of their lives. So even then they're my people and I love them. So I think it's really important to put aside this. What can I get from the tribe? You know, our people have already been through so much and to have more taken away from them just because you want to take and take it just, it's, it's hard sometimes for us to hear things like that. So when you come to Sam, talk about what you want to learn about your ancestors, but also try to dig into, I mean, he's a great resource. I hope I'm not overselling what you'll do for people, Sam, but I know that you have a passion about the tribes and our people and their ancestors and what they did. And so I highly recommend that you go deeper into learning about your culture and, and your people. Yeah. Listeners. And if you want to get specific about Chickasaw, here's the context for that. So in uh, 1907, when the Dawes roll closed, there were 50, I'm just going to use a round number here, uh, 5,600 uh, Chickasaw by blood members. That's the entire Chickasaw population that existed on planet Earth in 1907. Earth. Now, I don't know. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know um, what the U.S. population was, but at that time, but let's say tens of millions, probably. Um, right. Right. So the, the chances of being from a Chickasaw family, it's almost like coming from a very small, distinct town, right? Within the, okay, the larger yeah. U.S. <clears throat> and the chances that you're from that community and that you don't know or you're not enrolled are kind of slim. I mean, there are there can be family dis disconnection things, but if it if that did happen, it's not hard to reconnect because we're not talking about ancient history, you know, like... Um, it depends on your age cohort, I suppose. But for, let's say, middle-aged folks, if you're talking about your, uh, let's say, turn of the 20th century, you're, often you're right. talking about your great-grandparents, you know, and your grandparents were born in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So, and in some cases, like, shoot, I remember my, I lived with my great-grandparents um, until I was like in my late teens, early 20s. And believe it or not, I remember my great-great-grandmother as a young boy. <laughs> so, oh, do you really? I'm some, so in, jealous. Yeah, in some cases, yeah, you can, yeah. you really can span a lot of generations. So we're not talking about ancient history here. And we're talking about very specific history too. Like that's the thing. If you really are Chickasaw and say you are disconnected, you do have an obligation to go back and learn where your family came from because- yes. No, they didn't get to Oklahoma for no reason. There was a genocidal removal and, yeah. and they have a very distinct history. Oh, and also I should say too. So in some cases like Cherokees, um, there was a faction that stayed in the East. Seminoles, there was a faction that stayed in the East. Choctaws, Eastern faction, Creeks, Porch Band. Okay. Chickasaws did not stay in the East. They all 100% moved to Indian territory just because of the the nature of their uh, their tribe, the the population and their history. There was a, a small group of allied Colbert families that tried to stay in the very northern part of Mississippi and along the Tennessee border, but they eventually came to Indian Territory in the 1870s. Other than that, I've seen no Chickasaws that had, had stayed in the East. So unlike a lot of Eastern tribes, they're all Chickasaws moved to Indian Territory that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that fact. And they came a little bit later, right? Yeah, so they had a different setup um, where they had it, basically they were selling their lands that had been, you know, their Eastern lands that had to be um, surveyed. And then they were going to take that money to purchase lands in exchange for their Eastern lands. 
So they didn't have a reservation set up at first, and that's why they settled within the larger Choctaw Nation in the western portion. Um, but, you know, for a lot of Choctaw and Chickasaw folks that might be listening, you know, our tribes were are basically we're all just related. So, um, yeah. you know, in the eastern homelands, um, you know, we were close together. And then when we moved west, again, the same thing. We were set up close to each other. Um, the languages are so similar. The The origin stories are exactly the same. So, yeah. Uh, and to be frank, a lot of it, there's a lot of um, family stories and mythology that Americans have. So I foresee a lot of it explaining to folks that their lore is maybe not correct and doing that diplomatically. There, I'm sure you as definitely well as I have and many other people out there, we hear those family lores or tribal lores. Um, we also hear stories of our ancestors. I have a cousin who um, had told me about one of her aunts actually had their her baby on a table in the dining room um, many, many years ago. And it turns out that was just a joke in their family that they didn't the pe the elders who had made it up didn't realize the descendants had taken off with that story. So these things happen. And sometimes you're attacked when you bring to the table, hey, actually, when we really have done more research over the years, we found X, Y, Z. Yeah. And sometimes they don't want to hear it. So, right. um, but I do like that about a lot of your posts and how you're always trying to get to the truth. Even if it hurts a little bit, there's no yeah. disrespect meant. It's just right. about trying to get to the truth. Totally. And we're honoring our, our ancestors, wherever they come from. So, but that's interesting because you sort of self-identity can entrench and it can be built up around this lore. And if you believe in particular <laughs> lore and you entrench it and you really create this persona or identity, um, you're invested in it. So then when maybe details come up and it, let's say, debunks it, it's kind of hard to take. A lot of times these stories get developed to gov to cover more mundane uh, issues like um, out of wedlock births. Um, uh, you know, you uh. have a farmer's daughter who's 14, 15. She has a baby. Well, she hit her pregnancy and a baby springs up out of nowhere. So, oh, well, okay. some Indians that were on the Trail of Tears came through and they left their baby. You know, never mind that we hadn't seen farmer's daughter for you know, a few months, you know. Um, so it covered for a lot of these wow. things. And then the other aspect too, is like what you had mentioned, but it's like the game of telephone where the original story gets told for whatever reason. It could be just a offhand remark. Right. Um, you know, I heard that grandma, well, she had dark hair and high cheekbones. So I, I think she was probably Indian. The next generation, well, great grandma was said to be uh, Indian. And then the next generation, oh, great, great grandma was a full blood Cherokee Indian. So it, it can just... It, the story can be modified over generations. So I would say probably, and okay, we all know the Cherokee blood thing is the most common one, right? Um, yeah. And the the Cherokee tribe was known for mixing early, um, having the highest levels of mixture. Um, they were also in the Eastern areas that had early contact, right? Um, so there's a lot of those claims about Cherokee ancestry as well. Um, but yeah. if you say if you had 100 Americans with Cherokee blood lore, I would say one or two out of 100 might be accurate. The and majority of the tribe, tribe, too, which is the majority yeah. of the tribe was removed west. That's what people don't realize. So just demographically speaking, um, you know, even before the Trail of Tears, um, a faction of the tribe moved west um, between, you know, uh, early 1800s to 1836 before the Treaty of New Echota. And then the bulk of the tribe was removed in 1838 to 1839. So there were about 20,000 Cherokees. Um, I'm talking old settlers and the Eastern Cherokee that were removed. Only about 900 uh, Eastern Cherokee remained in the mountains of Southeast Tennessee, Western North Carolina, Northeast Georgia. And they became the nucleus group or the nascent population of what's today Eastern Band Cherokee Indian, right? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. other faction that stayed in the East, and there were some mixed bloods, they're counted in hundreds only. So for a frame of reference too, this to kind of contextualize this, in 1835, there was a Cherokee Nation census. It's also called the Henderson Roll. Mm -hmm. They went through, they enumerated the vast majority of the families in the Cherokee Nation border. At that time, 
there was just over 16,000 by blood members. There were only 201 intermarried whites at that time. And the tribe was about 80% full blood at that time. So that gives you a context of the demography. So a lot of times when people think the Cherokees mixed a lot or they went off and hid in the hills, no, that's that's not how it happened. Now, -hmm. there are folks that did stay in the East. The Eastern Band today, from 900 members in 1840, let's say, to the present time, there's about 16,000 people. I would say there's probably in that same ballpark figure of Eastern Cherokee mixed bloods who wouldn't be eligible for enrollment. We're not talking about huge numbers, like maybe yeah. 20,000 people tops that are Eastern Cherokee descendants. Yeah. So. so you mentioned that you would help with anything from finding ancestors on Dawes Rolls to looking for records and helping tie maybe some missing pieces of that family tree together for the folks that come to you, what is the entire scope from, from, you know, the basic package on up to the larger package that you do to help your clients? Yeah. So that's something we do. That's a little different, I think. Um, So because folks have different um, budgets and also genealogical needs, we have package deals. So it, it basically starts from the most basic would be a $50 package for um, base role lookup. So we'll find out what tribe, whatever tribe they suspect or, or they, they come from, what the tribe uses as their base role. And we'll, we'll look those up. So we have to get some basic information though. So you, you, for those uh, role lookups, you do have to have at least some name and some biographical information to narrow folks down. Then it goes up from there. So the next package, um, I think there's four different packages, but uh, the next one we go to about the turn of the 20th century to late 1800s along a specified lineage. Then the next package up would be pushing it back into the mid 19th century. Um, and then the the top uh, package, the, the Platinum Plus would be um, a more expansive tree along multiple lineages. Um, pushing back as far as possible in, in some cases within oh. reason. I mean, some 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 families can go back far. Like if you hit Europe and you hit a, a, a aristocracy, you can go back too far. But anyway, so we'll push back on multiple lines, find as much information as possible. Um, and then I also, it's not a package deal, but I also have a little button there if you have um, sort of a special project. And I actually, I got yeah. one. You, you did your plug the other day and I got a customer. So um, that's interesting. And for me too, I, so I love finding native ancestry, um, and, and uncovering history. And in some cases it's, it's from tribal members that are already enrolled. So they're not looking for, for that. They're just looking for more information or in some cases it's legit descendants who have very interesting lineages, but they're not enrollable, but you know what? It, your history is your history. So right. like, I'll give you an right. example. The right. other day, I was, I've been doing genealogy for a long time. So I just do it on, on different platforms. But yeah, um, somebody did a query on a Choctaw Indians uh, focused page and I, I jumped into it and they actually descended. Their their claim was legit. And it was a, a Favre family, F-A-V-R-E. Um, just like Brett Favre, the the right player. Favre. <laughs> he actually is a chocolate descendant too. Yeah, yeah. Is he really? Uh, no yes, he way. is. He's a legit. Wow. He's a legit descendant. Yes, absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah, but the Favre family, there are some enrolled and some non-enrolled, and so the the non-enrolled were the Choctaws that left the tribe. They intermarried and they left, severed their affiliation. Well, this this one lady had posted about her family and she wanted to know about it and. At first, I wasn't finding anything, but I, I kept pushing back. And then eventually I did find the connection and it was accurate. So uh, it was an early intermarriage and the the mixed blood guy uh, didn't live with the tribe. He moved to, I want to say New Orleans or mm-hmm. somewhere around New Orleans. And he was just living his life. But I found an article in the newspaper uh, in the South during the Civil War, and they they called him like a degenerate half breed or something like that, and they were mad at him because he had joined the Union Army and he was working as a scout for the Union Army in the Deep South. So they saw him as a traitor, and also he was a half breed Indian. But I, I was able oh, to find man. that, 
So I'm like, wow. I was able to tell this woman, like, not only is your your story accurate, but you actually have a union uh, soldier ancestor Amazing. that fought as a, he was a scout in the deep South. And, but eventually he was captured and killed. And then uh, uh, that's where the article, you know, called him basically a scallywag, but very interesting. So when you uncover these kind of stories, it's not, a, it's not all about, you know, tribal membership and whatever. It's like uncovering right. stories. That and, is uh, so fascinating. So I highly encourage anyone who is trying to look into their Native American heritage to please contact Sam. We're going to put some information on my Native Chalk Talk Facebook page, as well as many other places where I can plug the good stuff that he's doing. I would have, when I first started researching about the same time that you did, Sam, about 15 years ago, I could have used your services so much. <laughs> Listeners, you may have heard about the beautiful sculpture in Middleton County, Cork in Ireland called Kindred Spirits by artist Alex Pentec. This sculpture commemorates the gift from the Choctaws to the Irish during the famine. If you're ever in Ireland, be sure to check it out. And now on the grounds of our Choctaw Nation's capital, Tushkahoma in Oklahoma, Sam is working on a companion piece to the Kindred Spirits sculpture. So tell us about it, Sam. Yeah, so like a lot of people, I just happened to see this several years ago um, randomly. I think maybe it was in the tribal newspaper, but it was a very interesting story right away. It grabs you. So I, I remember thinking, that's very cool history, and I didn't know about it. And so I I, I had been thinking about it uh, for years, and it, it was given, getting a lot of uh, coverage. Um, mm -hmm. But I always have projects in mind. So I was actually thinking and talking to my wife and I, I said we should actually do a companion piece for that because it's so cool it's in Ireland but we should do one on the Choctaw Nation side so then me and her were kind of just um kicking around ideas so I had right. kind of fleshed it out already and then just you know a little while after that they did the announcement for the proposals and I, I read it. I'm like, Oh my God, I already had something in mind. So, oh my God. Uh, so this yeah, was so was like, meant was, to be. It was yeah. so perfect. Yeah. And so I got the proposal together and it was very specific. I mean, if you saw the notice, it, like the parameters were very specific. The, wow. the, the proposal itself was limited to four pages. It had to fit into certain budget uh line items and um but i thought okay so the the piece in ireland is say more on the native side because it's got the feathers in the shape of a basket mm -hmm. which is a cool design i mean it's very striking um but i thought well let's that's in ireland why don't we focus more on the irish motifs on our side you know do that nod so you can see there's the uh, Capitol building. Um, the actual location might change. This was just the initial site. Um, it could be further to the east, though. Um, okay. But I wanted to do. I wanted to do more of um, a Celtic specific design. So um, this is a design that you would see. So I didn't come up with this per se, but um, I wanted. So one of the parameters was you know Christian charity. And so I wanted the Trinity and then the heart, the giving heart, you know, because we're talking about gifts and from the heart. So all of that Celtic knotwork, there's no beginning and end. So that's where the eternal comes from. Um, and of course, since it's a Choctaw thing, we have to have diamonds. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Um, it's beautiful. So it'll be on a, it'll be on a pla uh, round platform with the diamonds um, embedded. Oh, um, amazing. And then, uh, so we don't, I'm not sure exactly the site, but you can see this location, there's sort of a, a winding path. And that in this, where this site was, that direct orientation was the Trail of Tears. And then there's an infographic um, mm. explaining the, the gift. Um, I also wanted a ceremonial platform. Interestingly, you know, as you dive into, you know, the Irish and the Choctaw connection, there's um, a lot of similarities in culture. There's, you know, like our Choctaw swirl designs. There's some Celtic swirl designs that are very similar. Um, our ceremonial mounds, um, they in Ireland, they have um, hill forts and they look okay. very similar. I can't remember the Gaelic name for them, but oh, they look very similar. So I thought, well, that, that can all kind of come together. 
And then um, on, on the actual concrete um, placement, we'll have um, the uh, orientation or the arrow pointing to Ireland or Dublin, I guess the capital and the, the mileage. Um, so everything, everything is about intersection um, and then uh, everything has meaning. Oh. Couldn't be more fitting. It's so perfect. And for listeners who are only listening today and are not watching on YouTube, I highly recommend you turn over to YouTube at some point to uh, complete this episode because there are going to be more visuals along the way and I hate for you to miss it. Um, but otherwise, you can also see more information on my Native Chalk Talk the Facebook page. I will be sure to post photos on there as well. So it sounds like you were already inspired, ready to go. And then how exciting was it when you were granted um, the ability to go ahead and create the sculpture? Oh, it was amazing. So this I, might be the coolest thing that I'll get to work on in my life, honestly. I mean, this is the, awesome. the symbolism and just uh, it's meaningful. You know, I, I've been doing art a long time and this is like high up on the list of the coolest things. So I do have to say, though, that this is a very complex piece. So and I, I do have a background in metalworking and I've actually done large installations in the past. But this is so complex that I, I needed help. So mm -hmm. it's actually being fabricated by Juno Works out of um, Colorado. Okay. And it's a structural steel that's, and you can see the Celtic knotwork, it's actually diving through, coming around. So it really is knotted. And the, the engineering on that is amazing. Oh, <laughs> I can, far, but... I bet. Oh, it's <laughs> so, so exciting. You... Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, the this project it, it's it's getting a lot of publicity so we want to do like a publicity tour and mm. for me like I don't I didn't really want it to be about me as an artist or or what whatnot I wanted it to be more about the story itself and so I actually thought well let's find um an example of a Chalka Irish personal connection or a real relationship and in my family I had known that my third great grandmother had married an Irish guy. Now he's not my direct ancestor. He, it, it was um, her second husband. I, I descend from her first husband, but I had okay. always known okay. that we had Choctaw cousins. And in the, in the days before the internet, I actually tried to find them and it's the O'Day family. And in Ireland, I guess it's pronounced O'D, but the Americans uh, say O'Day. O apostrophe D E A. So I knew that I had O'Day cousins, but this was before the internet. So I actually wrote some uh, <laughs> letters, mailed them because I was able to find the church that they go to. And they were living out West, either in California or um, Las Vegas. I can't recall, but I wrote to the their church uh -huh. and I never heard back. And this was <laughs> in probably, oh, the the mid 90s let's say mm -hmm. and so then i it kind of just went away well then with the age of the internet you can find your cousins easily so i found my cousin shannon robinson and she was hooked up with another cousin um named larry uh and he larry hardy and he was sort of the family historian and he's a no day descendant and he so we got in contact with him he said oh i know the whole the whole family history so he started filling us in um, and so the cool thing was this Irish guy, Michael O'Day, he was born in about 1840 in Ireland. And this was just before the, oh yeah, there you go. Okay. So this was just before, he was born just before the famine, but he grew up right in the famine and he was born in the West country. So County Clare, which was hard okay. hit. And it was also um, a Gaelic speaking region and they put up stiff resistance to Anglo colonialism. And they were one of the last families to be defeated by the English. Hmm. And hmm. so then they came over, we think, we don't know exactly, but he was a cowboy working in North Texas along the Texas Indian territory border. That's how he got into that area. And um, he, met my third great grandmother who was a Choctaw woman named Corinne or Karina Robinson from the Robinson family just south of Caddo and um, 
she was widowed. So my third great grandfather was murdered. And so then Michael O'Day came on the scene and then they were married. And he had a big ranch in the area. And my cousin, Larry, we were, when we went back to visit, he was pointing everything out um, where <laughs> there was actually an O'Day Lane and it's right next to Robinson Baptist Church. And he knew all wow. like, where the ranches were. And he still lives on a remnant of part of the, the property. So most oh of it's gosh. been, like, he, still, he still lives on the family land. And so <laughs> Larry, uh, he inherited the family's um, cattle brand. So it says OD. So just amazing. And he oh, knew cool. that they came from, um, I want to say, no, actually, I'm not going to say, cause I don't want to say the wrong uh, thing, but from County Clare, we don't know the exact mm -hmm. village or town where they came from, but he knows where they immigrated from. So anyway, the, the O'Day family actually has a, they call it a castle, but it's more of like a fortified um, tower where they were fighting cool. the English. Oh my god. So gosh. what we wanted to do. Did you get to see it? Well, here's the proposal. This is what we're working on. So we want to go to Ireland to the O'Day Castle. And also we're we're talking about doing a presentation at the University of Cork. But I wanted to we grab some stones from the Robinson Cemetery. We want to place them at the O'Day Castle and also take rocks and oh. you know, vice versa. And so we, we, I just got back from the Robinson Family Cemetery, and um, this is in um, Bryan County, okay. so just east of Durant, um, north of the little town of Blue and south of Caddo for local folks. And okay. uh, that that road, I don't know what the the county road is uh, or the state road, but it's it was called Robinson Road. So everyone there is like Robinsons. <laughs> so to put this into context, Larry Hardy is my. He would he and my grandmother would be second cousins, half second cousins, because they share the same grade. <laughs> right. A lot of these tribal cemeteries, they're not on tribally owned land. So um right. that so we it there's eight grave sites at Robinson, seven Choctaws and one Irish guy, Michael O'Day. Mm -hmm. Um so we actually had to reach out to the homeowner or the landowner and uh get access um, but just f as an fyi for listeners for, so if, if you have this kind of situation where the cemetery is on um non-tribal land or non-family land it's state law that descendants have access to their um ancestors graves so That's you, they, so you cool. can't be denied so you do have to reach out if you can um, you're supposed to give them a heads up just to because yeah. you know some yeah. of this For stuff is rural. Reasons, you might you get might shot. Wanna... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, but they you have to you, you they have to let you uh, visit. And there's a uh, office within the tribe. I don't know it right off hand, but it's um, Skylar Robinson. Um, I don't know if he's related to our Robinson, but he's sort of the point of contact for the the graves. Um, I think he's the GIS um, specialist. Okay. The, okay. the tribe is trying to catalog all of our tribal cemeteries. I, I don't know if we've done it 100%. There's, there still might be some cemeteries out there, but I would say the majority are have been cataloged. And Skylar is good about granting, or he has um, contact information. So if you need access, check in with Skylar. Um, and then a lot of times he, he'll um, he'll have the uh, landowner's information. And so we went to Robinson Cemetery. It was actually in a cow pasture. The tribe had put up some fencing several years ago. And the tribe also has a program where they clean up old cemeteries. So if stones are fallen, they might pick those up. They'll clean out some brush. But nice. I got to say, once they clean out that brush, if it's not maintained, it comes back like crazy. It was so thick in there that we could only mm -hmm. find a few of the stones. It was wow. incredible. Um, so I, I did so a little stuff. I know I did a little ceremony for our ancestors on the site, on the side of the cemetery. And we oh, found good. one of the stones of our relative. Um, I couldn't actually couldn't find Michael's uh, stone. So, but anyway, oh. we, we grabbed some, um, some keepsakes and we we brought some stones so hopefully when we go to ireland we'll be able to to leave those and do a little ceremony there i love that the bottom picture of corinne is yeah. that i assume that's yeah you near present day eagleton was there a name of that actual 
cemetery. Oh, so yeah. So just to kind of take it further back um, on this line, the Robinson line. So it descends from the Folsom family. So Emily Folsom married Amzi Robinson, and they came over on the Trail of Tears. Um, but Emily um, and her brother, Nathaniel, um, they died on the Trail of Tears just as they crossed over into Indian territory. Oh. And it's, I think it's unmarked, but um, some folks, um, you know, some descendants might know the general vicinity, um, but I yeah. don't think it's a marked grave. Calvin was Corinne, Corinne, uh, Corinne's um, father, and he came over on the Trail of Tears, and his sort of claim to fame, or the family's very proud of, was he was the first Choctaw baby baptized by um, uh, Reverend uh, Kingsbury. Really? So when, yeah, so that was the, I want to say 1828-29 time period. And then he became an ordained minister and he would preach in Choctaw. And um, he also, he would show up on a lot of, he sh was, since he was a reverend, he did a lot of marriages. So he shows up on a lot of records as well. So I'm really curious now, tell us about the O'Days, the whole story. I, I know you've got some crazy little things that kind of went on with that family. Yeah, so... Well, so I should say that the Michael O'Day um, was Corinne's second husband, um, and he was the Irish immigrant. Um, but her first husband was actually murdered, and it had been a big family mystery. And so then on this trip, we we basically stumbled on you know the truth of it, and it it all it ties into a story that um, that is talked about it within the tribe too. And there was, a, um, a David H Folsom that was murdered by Marshall supposedly. And you can actually search online. You can, there's videos about it. And it kind of gives that family history. Well, David H Folsom murdered my third great grandfather and nobody knows about it. Like, so he wow. was actually a Sunday school teacher at Robinson um, Baptist Church on Robinson Road. And for some reason, David H. Folsom came and called him out of uh, Sunday school in front of the kids and shot him down and murdered him. And David H. Folsom was a relative of Corinne Robinson. So to put this into perspective, David H. Folsom and Corinne were second cousins. Their fathers were first cousins. Okay. And okay. he was only 16 at the time. And he was, a, apparently he was a real troublemaker. There's a, a common story that is told within the tribal community that this guy, David H. Folsom, was murdered unfairly. Like, no, he was a desperado. He was a bad and he dude. Was kind of, he was, he was, and he was kind of protected because of his position. So his father was- he was a Folsom. <laughs> exactly. His father was Loring Folsom, who was a no judge in, in Choctaw Nation. And- his grandfather was Colonel David Folsom, the chief during removal. And then his mom, Malvina Pitchland, was the daughter of Peter Pitchland. So he was chief, you know, double chief descendant. So he was sort of like uh, aristocracy, I guess, or the little it's golden like the boy. PK, the, the yeah. master's kid, so you know. They totally, they totally protected him. And so when we Gosh. were down in Oklahoma, we were visiting uh, the genealogical library in... Um, Oh shoot, I'm drawing a blank on the name. It's such a good place. Just south of the casino. What's that little town's name? Um oh, Calera, shoot, I can't Calera? Yeah, yeah, Calera. The, yes, thank you. So Calera Genealogical um library. It's just a tiny little building. You could drive by it and not even notice it was there. But they've got some ladies in there that they're all volunteer, and it's one of the best awesome. genealogical. Places and you I've know those ladies to. know what they're talking about. They probably yeah, been there yeah, for years. So <laughs> anyway, they had they they actually went in and got um you know uh Choctaw Nation um legal briefs, um legislative sessions, yeah. notes, personal letters, clippings from old newspapers that haven't been published. So it's like and and you go in and you tell them a name and then they would set it down in front of you and you open it up and you're just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So we're sitting there reading the personal letters of Malvina, who was the mother of David H. Folsom. And right. she's totally, she's like talking about how he was just shot down and in cold blood for no reason. And 
it, all, in, English was also her second language, so you could tell that Choctaw was her first language. But right. Anyway, <laughs> she she was just going on and on about how he, you know, t- t- she doesn't know what to do with herself. She uh, he's murdered, and then we fa- we ha- we had some letters from Loring, the father, and he was a little more, uh, let's say, honest about his son's dealings, and he's like, yeah, he's kind of a a troublemaker and I always have to clean up after him well anyway after he murdered my third great grandfather William Puckett by the way Mm -hmm. he fled down into Texas so that was in 1877 and he was I think this is just my uh kind of analysis He, he got caught back in Choctaw Nation in 1880 where the shootout happened and he had eight bottles of whiskey and it, Choctaw Nation was dry at the time. So I think he was oh, running liquor. Right. Well, the marshals, because there wasn't, at that time, the marshals didn't really get involved in, in stuff as much. It was like liquor running would have been one that marshals would have uh, got involved. And he also right. had an outstanding warrant for his arrest for the murder of my third great grandfather, <laughs> which doesn't really that... show up in any records. It's so weird. But anyway. Oh my God. The marshals tried to detain him and he shot his pistol at them. So then the marshal shot back. So like this, this story that he was gunned down unfairly was no, no. Right. No, oh. that's not what happened, y'all. <laughs> oh my and God. The crazy thing is, is if you, you can search, there's, there's online uh, videos and, and stories about it in the Gethsemane or uh, the Gilgo um, Cemetery just east of Caddo, Oklahoma, right. is where a lot of these Folsom families are are buried. And he has a big stone. And it the 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 story there's an interesting thing because they had um, taken the bullet out of his body, and they placed it inside of this special um, stone cap that went on top of the stone, and. So for years, you could actually go and you lift it up and look at the bullet, but eventually um, vandals stole it or it got lost. Of course they did. But that was the big, yeah, so that was the big claim to fame in that cemetery is like, you go look at the bullet for David H. Folsom where he was murdered by marshals. Um, Well, That's amazing. uh, So he was only 16 when he murdered my third great grandfather. And it was only two and a half years after that he was uh, shot by marshals. But in that time, he had a child out of wedlock and his father had to cover for him again. So even though the child was illegitimate, they legitimized the kid and enrolled him because he wouldn't have been inel- he would have been ineligible for enrollment. So they did a special session for David H. Folsom's son. Oh, well, David gosh. H. Folsom's son was, I believe, David S. Folsom, but don't quote me on that. Well, and then he grew up to be sort of an outlaw, too. <laughs> So like the apple oh. doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, yeah. He did time down in Texas, and I don't, I didn't delve too much into his history, but I just thought it was interesting that, like his oh father, he God. he had trouble with the law, and uh, but one interesting point of note, um, he was sent to the same uh, prison farm. I can't remember the name of it now, but where um, Bonnie and Clyde, Clyde Burroughs, he he had been at that Texas institution. And that was one of the places where he hated that he, you know, he always vowed that he was going to go back and get revenge on it. It it was apparently very brutal and it was like a work uh, camp kind of thing. Well, anyway, David S. Folsom spent time there. And then he came back and he was involved in petty crime and then he changed his name to a weird spelling. um, And he pops up occasionally asking for money from the tribe, but um, that's pretty much all I, I took from it. But so I had scary. come across that story years ago and it, it intersected with mine. Like, no, he murdered my ancestor. <laughs> Are we not going to talk about that? <laughs> right, exactly. Well, and I think it's funny, like you said, when we're, again, trying to hang on to what we think right. is this good, positive story and the Folsoms. Right. And yes, they were a good family overall, but they had some hoodlums too. And that guy, Larry, that you met, met that kind of showed you around, kudos to Larry. You know, I love the Larrys of the world that go, I know everything about this area. I'm going to show you around and here's oh, where yeah. the bullet used to oh, be. And yeah, yeah, here's yeah. Robinson totally. Road. Yeah. O'Day Lane, which Hi, Larry. by the way, didn't have a, didn't have a, a sign on it. I guess at one time it did, but he knew where oh. it was at. 
yeah no so it's, it's interesting history maybe we'll kind of segue into another aspect of chocolate history is like um there's some history that's unsavory but we have to kind of tackle it yeah and that's the, the freedman issue so, like all of the five tribes the five civilized tribes um so these tribes had slaves african slaves um you know they were purchased from american uh uh slave auction or or traded and they were worked in very similar fashion to you know the, the the slavery system that we think of in the american southeast i've seen some people kind of uh, try to downplay the the system that you know indian slave owners treated their slaves better but it's like first of all in relative degrees, not that different. And also you mm -hmm. did have slave owners, tribal members that had huge plantations and they were operating in the same kind of way as, as a, a white Southern plantation. So there was okay. no difference. And, and there, right. you, you could have tribal members that were brutalizing their slaves, you know, so, but anyway, so the five tribes um, picked up the practice of slavery. Now, not, it, it was a minority of um, tribal members and, uh, I don't know what the percentage would be, but I, I've seen it, you know, low single digits. Um, um, but there were several thousand uh, Choctaw slaves. And after the Civil War was over, actually in 1866, all the five tribes had to come up with their um, with treaties with the, the central government to um, give citizenship to their former slaves. And so 1866, in fact, that's interesting because American slaves would have been freed in 1865, but if you were enslaved by the tribes, you had to wait till 1866 when the treaty went into effect. But anyway, they were given citizenship. <clears throat> well, they were always treated as sort of second-class citizens and, and the tribes kind of begrudgingly gave them that status. But after um, allotment, <clears throat> and the tribes were basically considered defunct in some ways in mm -hmm. 1907 um really there was there were no um new tribal members so I, in fact i'm old enough to remember when someone would say original enrollee and everyone else mm -hmm. was just called a descendant right so right. after 1907 um people born after that weren't even really citizens um the tribes didn't get reorganized until later. So like the Choctaw Nation in the 1970s, they um, were able to avoid termination. And then um, I wanna say, was it 72 or 73? They got their first constitution up and then it was finalized in the early eighties. Uh, don't quote me on that, but um, when they reestablished the Choctaw Nation, they made enrollment contingent upon by blood. So it effectively cut out freedmen because freedmen were citizens based on the 1866 treaty mm -hmm. or naturalization, if you want to put it another way. They weren't by blood. Now, people know about the Cherokee freedmen, but all the five tribes have freedmen and the right. Cherokee nation actually brought the freedmen back in after a lot of political wrangling. But today, the Choctaw freedmen are not recognized. And now, mm -hmm. some will argue that it should be just based on by blood, okay, and that, that they could make a justification on that. And then some people will bring up sovereignty. And that's all true. You could have, you could have any parameter that you want as a tribal nation. It's at your discretion, collectively, as a polity. Mm -hmm. You could have, we could establish one half blood requirement like Mississippi ban. But we don't. We use descendancy and we use by blood. Well, OK, no matter what you think on on the blood angle. So there are freedmen out there to kind of give you a historical context. There are freedmen out there that were on the Dawes roll listed with their blood. But because of their phenotype, they were African and their line of descent was black on their mother's side. Guess what role they got put on? I'll give you a real world example. Probably last year, again on a Choctaw centric Facebook page, uh, I, I jump on a lot of the um, ancestry or genealogical queries. I see you there. Somebody post, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Somebody posted about their great grand grandparents or grandfather, let's say, and uh, they wanted to know if they could enroll. So first thing I do is check to see if the query and the claims are legit. And so I, I jumped into this case. And so I pull it up 
everything that they put was was accurate. The dates were lining up, the people, the lineages, everything was was spot on. So then I can really dive in and see what the status was. Mm -hmm. So their ancestor, their great grandfather, um, was giving testimony before Das Commission in the early 1900s. He could not speak English. He was Chickasaw Choctaw, and he spoke probably both of those languages, but it was in Choctaw. He didn't speak a word of English. And it listed his um, ancestry or his family connections, like a lot of DOS packets do. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, it'll talk about like who your family is, your mother, father, mm -hmm. grandparents, and um, what roles you may have been on. So they went through all of those. On the paternal side, it even listed, I, I want to say it was a Jones family, but they were like the 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 paternal side was full blood native. And on the mother side, they were half native, half black, or maybe even a quarter black. I, I, it, it was like partial black, but mostly native. <laughs> right. And because it came through the maternal side that they were African and that that line had been enslaved, they got put onto the Freedman rolls. So here's somebody in in the in 2023 or 2022, I can't remember exactly, that is of relatively high blood quantum comparable to what a lot of modern tribal members would have. Their ancestor didn't speak English in the early 1900s. Their ancestry was known, oh, and by the way, I should mention that they actually had Choctaw names, which was very unusual for uh, someone on Dawes to have a, a Choctaw only name listed. You you come across it, but it's exactly. not as common. But they right. they were using just Choctaw names. And here's a, a modern descendant in 2023 that can't enroll mm -hmm. because of this Freedman thing, you know? Even though that, again, that ancestor did not even speak English and was right. more Choctaw Chickasaw than they were African-American. And yet- yeah. They can't enroll because they again were, were the matrilineal quarters. line they followed the matrilineal yeah. line and so yes oh my gosh that's nuts yeah so this is real world stuff i mean i come across this not so yeah. infrequently yeah and i mean that's probably just one of many examples well probably now we're going to find more examples of those all the time <laughs> yeah it, it's it's yeah. little details like that that you just don't even know what was going on back then and it th there were variables it wasn't all black and white so since you're well-versed on the history of the Choctaw, I'd love to walk through a few topics together. So here goes. Um, a lot of people don't know there were and still are, in some cases, Choctaw clans. And I'll admit, I know very little on the topic. What do you know about the clans? So clans, there's a little bit of a confusion about clans and divisions. Um, so and in some cases, the, the lines are blurred. So um originally there were three main districts and some people call them clans but there's okla tanup um okla falaya and okla hanali six towns so six towns was in the southeast uh okla falaya was the west or northwest and okla tanup was uh the northeast okay. those were just the broad divisions but sometimes people would would identify as from there and so that was their clan and then within those groups you had um, clan affiliations like um, Okla Tanup could also be called uh, Haya Patuklo or Ahe Patuklo, the potato eating clan. Um, but then there were clans that were matrilineal and there were an, a number and a lot of those are lost and I don't even know all of them but uh, off the top of my head like the Reed clan, the Turtle clan, uh, Big People clan, um, so a lot of these these clans um, were lost. So especially after removal, and then with intermarriage and and conversion to Christianity too, um, the nature of society just kind of shifted, and a lot of that information was lost. Uh, and especially too, like when you know allotment was going on, and and the turn of the twentieth century, where kids were assimilation was a, a huge. Uh, force and so a lot of this information just wasn't passed down so a lot of folks don't know their clans and a, probably a, a good number of Choctaw citizens probably wouldn't have clan affiliation because it would have to be your mother's 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 mother and you'd have to remember that and 
pass that down so and then if if um if you're married into like your father doesn't have a clan or you're a non marries a non-native or something like that then you lose your clan right it, exactly yeah yeah right you could actually be a pretty high blood but if you just by random happenstance of intermarriage descend from a european woman that married in a long time ago you wouldn't have a clan i mean a lot of uh, assimilation was really a potent force around the turn of the 20th century especially and a lot of cultural practices were lost in mm -hmm. fact, I don't know how many people know this, but like mm -hmm. a lot of the ceremonial um, dress that we we think of today with like the um, diamond shirts and the, some of the songs that we sing, they actually came from the last group of Mississippi Choctaw to move up. So they were sort of the traditionalists in, in Mississippi. A lot of these things were lost already in Choctaw Nation and they, they, they infused that like around... Uh, um, like the Choctaw Chickasaw border area where, where they settled. I can't remember the name right. of the town right now, but um, anyway, some of the last very traditional Ch Chickasaws and Choctaws kind of maintained this uh, community and they passed on those, those songs and, and the dances. Hmm. Uh, but like, yeah, cause there was a later removal, right? <clears throat> Yes. In fact, the, the Choctaw removal was interesting because it started in the early 1830s, but then there were, um, they call them immigrant parties, but there were several immigrant parties through the 1830s and then into the 1840s. Then it kind of went into a lull, but there were still some in the 1850s. And then around uh, the late 1800s, there was another push. And then a final one in around 1903 or early 1900s was that final push uh, of Mississippi Choctaws. So they would come up to get allotments so they were eligible. And this was under the uh, Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. They were able to come up and, and get allotments, but some of those were actually disenfranchised. If you didn't come mm. up at a certain time, you didn't get it. Um, right, there was a right. lot of dirty dealings. I think there was a documentary that was done um, Deanna Bird. not too many ago. It's something like I will not forget. Yeah. Something. Yeah, it's it so good too. Life. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There are I know some tribal folks. Oh, so here's the cool thing, yeah. on their tribal on the CBIB. I don't know if it's on the tribal ID card, but on old CBIBs, I'm old enough to remember, you would see someone that would have, it would say, Mississippi, uh, it's Mississippi uh, band of Ch uh, Choctaw Nation or something like that, where it would still identify you as a Mississippi. Choctaw that came up and joined the Choctaw Nation. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> that's so fascinating. Yeah. And if you think about it, the first removal that again, were around the 1830 to 1830 and, mm -hmm. and beyond up to 1906, a lot can happen in that time. So it sounds like the Oklahoma Choctaws lost a lot of their culture. Mm -hmm. And then when you had that, those Mississippis coming back in going, hey, we're the original gangsters. We're here to actually yep. tell you how to play stickball. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's a fascinating thing that, oh my gosh, they were removed long enough that they had started to lose that culture, especially being forced to assimilate. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Stay tuned for part two coming up. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends.